Hello, my friend, and welcome to Something For Everybody. My name is Aaron Mashbitz, and today is a solo episode of the podcast where I'm discussing Mental Health Awareness Month, my sister, and suicide loss. This episode is something that I do every single year on this podcast and is one of two most important episodes that I do. This one comes in May, the other one comes out in September, and for those that are unfamiliar or new listener to the podcast, they're important because May, for two reasons, is Mental Health Awareness Month, and May 1st is my sister Rachel's birthday. September is Suicide Awareness Month, and September is the month that I lost my sister Rachel to suicide. So I do this episode every year on May, in May and in September. I've done it for the last three or four years with this podcast, and I will continue to do it forever. Not only to remember my sister and the amazing, beautiful person that she is and still continues to guide me every single day, but to also talk about mental health, which is really a theme on this podcast, but to get really specific on some details. Um, so please check out the previous ones that I've released in May and September leading up to this one, which you're hearing this now. It's already in May. My sister's birthday is on May 1st. She would have been 34 years old. She was born May 1st, 1990, 34 years old. And so if you're listening to this, we're in May. It's Mental Health Awareness Month, and there are a few things that I'm going to talk about in relationship to Mental Health Awareness Month that I think are very important to help us move the needle forward. I'm also going to talk about, you know, what it's really like, what it's actually really like to lose someone you love to suicide and what some people might forget or miss or not understand, and I'm going to try and explain that to the best of my ability. And I'll do something similar again in September. I do these every year um, because my sister uh, was the most amazing big sister that anyone could ever ask for. Um, I'm, I was a very lucky and, and, and still am a very lucky brother um, to have her guiding me and teaching me lessons. And me and my parents uh, have been doing the absolute best job that we can to, to move forward with this, to love, to accept. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those things. And so thank you for tuning in. This is an extremely important episode to me um, and one of the big reasons why I do this podcast. So thank you. And here's a very important quote um, that I think sums up a lot of what I might be feeling or trying to explain in this episode. And I apologize if, if I don't explain it right. I, I usually do these episodes, just whatever comes to my brain, because I want it to be as free flowing and as organic as possible and as authentic as possible, especially when I'm talking about my sister, because I'm, I'm just letting my heart speak. I'm letting my heart speak and um, hopefully it makes sense. So here's the quote. A person never truly gets over a suicide loss. You get through it day by day. Sometimes it's moment by moment. And that's exactly true. Sometimes it's moment by moment. Sometimes it's day by day. Sometimes it's week by week. You know, there's stretches of moments in time that are better than others, depending on what's happening in your life. But you never get over it. Like, oh, you'll get over it. You'll move on. No, you move forward with it. It's always a part of your being. For the rest of my life, it will be. And, and I'm okay with that because I want to love and remember my sister for the rest of my life. But I'm never getting over it. I'm trying to move forward with it to remain someone who can still be happy and smile and have great moments and express joy. But also when that wave of, of sadness or grief or whatever emotion comes when I'm thinking about my sister in sort of these random moments or days, I feel it. I experience it. I let it happen and know that she's with me. She's guiding me. And these are, these are just feelings and emotions that I can allow to come through. I accept them. They don't overtake me like maybe they used to. I'm not fighting back against them maybe like I used to. But I'm allowing myself to feel and expressing those feelings with people in my life, whether that be my fiance and future wife, you know, things of that nature. And those that really know what's going on who really know my sister and, and what she meant to me and, and the lessons she taught me and, and how truly amazing she was. And so that's really important. And then we think about May being Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, we have to move past awareness. I, I think the 
the mental health frame needs a rebrand, it needs sexier uh, targeting, it needs sexier marketing, but really like it can't be mental health awareness month anymore. It has to be mental health action month. Okay, we understand, we're aware of mental health, or at least at this point, majority of people are aware of mental health. Mental health is how you think, feel, and act. So it encompasses our whole life. Every person on this planet thinks, feels, and acts. And so everyone has mental health. So it's no longer about creating awareness. Yes, there's still things that might be stigmatized. There's still things that we need to get over. We're also combating mental health information on social media and therapy speak and you know, uh, self diagnoses, all of these things that are part of now the mental health culture that maybe we didn't see coming 10 years based on some of the technology that's advanced and how many more people are speaking about these things. And, but we have to move past the mental health awareness, right? I talk about this important three step approach when trying to make a change in your life or trying to take care of your mental health or your physical health over or your overall well being. And it's a three step approach that I think can be applied perfectly to the idea of all of these months, but more specifically to the idea of mental health and what step we need to take next to move the needle forward so that we can create a society that is mentally well that is mentally well. And so the idea is awareness, acceptance, action. Awareness, acceptance, action. We got the awareness down, right? What is awareness? It's first recognizing that there's a thing that might need to be changed, right? A while back, we had to recognize that mental health was just as important as physical health, maybe even more important to the overall joy and fulfillment of our life, and that we needed to prioritize it. We're aware of that. You have feelings, you have emotions, you have thoughts that come up. How can we emotionally regulate? How can we be emotionally healthy, emotionally agile to be able to handle what life throws at us and not be taken down? We're like waves. We're riding the waves of our emotions to be able to you know, participate in an active way in life and control the things that we have control over, which is, you know, ourselves for the most part and our body language and our self-talk and how we feel and accept emotions that may come through. So that's all part of this awareness, right? We've moved past the stage of awareness. We have. We recognize that it's important, at least the majority of us, the people that are trying to do the best work in the mental health field have recognized that it's very, very, very important. I talk about it over and over and over on this podcast because to me, it's the most important thing that we can take care of. Everything else comes from that and everything else that we do is also bi-directional for that. Everything we do for our physical health impacts our mental health and vice versa. That's why I talk about eating well, moving well, sleeping well, and thinking well. Those are the foundations pieces of being the absolute best version of yourself in greatest service of the world. And you have to dial in on your fundamentals. You have to be brilliant at the basics. And then that is going to help your physical health, your mental health, and your overall well-being. So it all works in unison. And we have to understand. So we first become aware. We've recognized that mental health is important. So Mental Health Awareness Month needs to change to Mental Health Action Month. And for those of us that are in the field, in the trenches, working in the mental health space, every day is Mental Health Awareness Month. 12 months out of the year, 365 days. And really, we're not, we don't, I'm not as much concerned. I don't know what other people are doing. I'm not much concerned about awareness anymore. I'm I'm concerned about the next two steps, which are acceptance and action. Most importantly, the the last step, action. We have to take action. Nothing is ever going to change, no matter how aware I am of it, unless I move into action. And so Mental Health Awareness Month, cool. We got it. Awareness. Awesome. Next step would be acceptance. I think I think there's still some people that need to accept the fact that mental health is important. They're aware of it. They've heard the terms. They've seen the posts. They've seen the videos, whatever, 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 so on and so forth. But now they need to accept it. Accept the fact that it's a powerful mover in whatever domain you're in, whether it's high performance, whether it's creating the best students or the most mentally sound employees or the most mentally sound, mentally well family. We have to accept that this needs to be a part of the discussion of education, the discussion in youth sports. All of these things can be places where we can start to give these tools to our young people so that they're extremely versed in how to take care of their mental and physical going into their adult or young adult life. And so we have to make the acceptance step. 
You cannot fight against reality because reality will always win. We have to accept what point we're at. Right now, we have lots of people deeply, deeply struggling with their mental health, and we have to accept that. We have to accept the constraints of reality, what's real, what's not going away, what can't we change, what can we change, what can we improve, that's acceptance. Not saying, you know, uh, not accepting example would be like, if I'm, uh, you know, 100 pounds overweight, and I don't accept the fact that my diet is not very good, right? I'm probably not eating the most appropriate foods for what I need to be doing. Now, there's some other factors that go into that. Obviously, nothing is just, you know, plain black and white, except for a very few situations. But what I mean by that, probably not the best example, but if you catch my drift, is that we have to accept it is exactly what it is. And then we have to surrender to that idea so that we can be an active participant in the action moving forward. I was taking a drink here. Okay. And so we have awareness. We've done that. Now we've moved into acceptance. We accept it as is. This is what it is. This is my starting point. I mean, you can think about it Maybe this is a better analogy, a better way to look at it. You can think about it as your starting point for a habit. I've talked about this before, but thinking about starting your habits at too small to fail. Okay, if you want to start an exercise routine, or you want to start meditating. Okay, a meditation routine too small to fail would be I'm taking one deep breath one time per week. Or I'm doing one jumping jack one time per week. Those habits are too small to fail. And then you incre incrementally, incrementally, move up from there and those things compound and aggregate then over the six seven nine ten twelve two three year period now you can meditate for 15 minutes three times a week now you go to the gym two to three times a week right because you've built in the habit but you started too small to fail because you accepted exactly where you were you accept it. This is my starting point. Man, I haven't worked out in three years. Man, I've never worked out before. I've never meditated before. Ah, you know, okay, cool. This is where I'm at. No shame, no guilt. This is me. This is my starting point. And if I can move up incrementally, very small steps every day, moving forward, too small to fail, man, I could be somewhere crazy good in two to three years. That's how much time I'm giving me. A long horizon, deep perspective, right? So we have awareness acceptance, and then the final step, and most important, is action. So again, this is the stage we need to start being at for mental health. Uh, thunder and lightning here, and a little bit of rain kind of scared me a little bit. So if you're watching this on video, you may have, uh, you may have seen me jump, but uh, anyways, I accept it. <laughs> um, and so the last step, most important step, is moving into action 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 so again i think may and mental health need to be rebranded to be more sexy to say mental health action month we're no, again we're no, i'm no longer concerned i can't say we but i think people who are doing this work should adopt this mind frame as well we're no longer in the awareness and we have, and we're moving into acceptance and accepting the fact that this is our reality this is what's happening these are the people that are struggling these people need our help and how can we move into action phase to actually help them to become a society that is proactive about our mental health that's really what i'm trying to get to when i talk about mental health action month what are the tools specific tools that we can start teaching people at the youngest age possible so they can start being proactive about their mental health. We're talking about journaling, optimism practice, a gratitude practice, a movement practice, eating well, thinking well, sleeping well, teaching all of these fundamentals, these basics of being the best version of yourself. So when life hits you hard, which it inevitably will in every situation, in every life, death, setbacks, challenges, obstacles, heartbreak, rejection, all of these regular human things that we go to go through, we have the ability the tools and the mindset to go and handle those things a little more healthy than we would otherwise. We don't have to start from scratch on building our mental health toolkit because we've already dedicated lots of time to thinking about what's in our toolkit, what makes us feel better, and how can we overcome these challenges and setbacks. Now there's like some other you know, 5% of life, let's say that things just are, are really bad and they suck. And the goal of those things is to just get through them. But 95% of life 
is these challenges, these setbacks, these obstacles that we can overcome that can fuel our growth. But if we're not, if we don't understand what mental health action actually looks like, if we haven't built a set of tools, a proactive set of tools to be able to handle these situations, we're always going to be starting from scratch. And so again, awareness, acceptance, action. Action means building out your mental fitness toolkit with the right tools in there that work specifically for you in regards to eating, moving, sleeping, and thinking. Thinking encompasses a lot of different things, a breathing practice, meditation, optimism, gratitude. How do you move? How do you eat? Do you prioritize your sleep? All of these things are foundational pillars that impact our physical and mental health. And they're things that we have to do every single day. Self-care is not something that you do every once in a while. Self-care is a commitment to your future self. So it's something you do every single day. It's a non-negotiable for your life because it makes you feel better and it improves your quality of life. That's self-care, not going to the spa every 24 months. It's commitments. It's little commitments you make to yourself to do every single day to improve the overall fabric of your life. And so that's what we need to transform Mental Health Awareness Month into is Mental Health Action Month. Getting into schools and businesses and teaching people how to actually take care of their overall of their overall health in conjunction with physical and mental and how it all goes together in one to make the most mentally sound, physically fit, overall strong, resilient, you know, compassionate individual that understands what tools and non-negotiables and strategies they can use to be mentally fit. And so we go from awareness, acceptance, action. We have to move into action. Action is the only thing that's going to move the needle forward. And we must move the needle forward because there's too many people struggling and mental health must be a priority and we must get proactive with it. So that's my spiel on mental health awareness month. And then the other reason why this month is so important, like I stated at the beginning is because of my sister. She was born May 1st, 1990. And she unfortunately lost or took her life, took her own life, um, September 3rd of 2018. So we're coming up on, you know, six years. I'll do another episode in September, you know, celebrating her anniversary. Um, also September of this year, I'm getting married. Um, and so it's a beautiful month. I had purposely put my wedding in September because when I think about my sister, you know, yes, I, I do get sad and I miss her so, f- so much. Um, but I also think about the amazing moments that we had together. And I want September to be a month where we celebrate, where me and my parents, my family, my fiance, future wife celebrate. We also celebrate our wedding and our love, but we also celebrate the life of my sister and, and the amazing things that she accomplished her resilience, her fight, her love, her smile, her joy, her non-judgmental attitude. And for the same reason, I, I, in May, I'm going on my bachelor party. As you're listening to this, May 3rd, this episode drops. So maybe you're listening to this on the day, the day after, whatever the case may be. I'm currently, I will be not currently right now. I'm at my house filming this episode, but when you listen or watch it, I will be in Austin for my bachelor party with my best friends. And I also did that the first weekend of May because I wanted it to be a celebration. My sister was born on May 1st, and that's that's a beautiful day. May 1st, 1990, an absolute angel came into this world. And I chose to do that in May because I want to be around my friends, the people that love me, the people that I love, with, with my beautiful angel sister guiding me and is showing me the way. And so I I specifically have done those two things to make months that that may seem very sad and still have their very, 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 very sad moments to them. But there's also something to celebrate in those months because as I've moved through this journey, I've learned that emotions can exist mutual. I can feel joy and sadness in the same moment. That's okay. I accept that. I move through that. I work through that. I'm feeling a lot of those mutual emotions here recently, thinking about getting married and thinking about, oh man, it could be the absolute best day. Everyone that I love the most in the room, 
beautiful friends and family, my fiance's family, her friends, all of our friends, all of our family, fucking incredible. Very, very, very rarely does that happen where every person you love the most is in one room together, very rarely. And you, I'm so grateful and appreciative about it. And I just want to be able to savor those moments. But I also know at the same time, my sister will not be there. And I'll feel sadness for that, but I'll also feel immense joy. And through these almost six years of working through these emotions and these feelings, I've gotten better at it. I've gotten better at it. I'm not perfect. I still work through these things and study and learn and talk to people and have group sessions and all of these things that I'm trying to do to uncover myself and who I am and who I want to be and the things about my sister that I love the most that I want to represent in myself. Um, and so I'm learning that I'm learning that as I go, because you know, what it's really like to lose someone you love to suicide is the most life altering and catastrophic thing that I think anyone can experience. Now I've never, you know, I've lost a couple grandparents, um, you know, but losing my sister was was the is was is the most painful thing that I've ever gone through and I don't know if you've if you're watching or listening to this if you've if you've lost someone you love um, but there's nothing like losing someone you love and just like not knowing that it's coming and not knowing the last time you see them is the last time you see them that's the, the, the hardest part about it all. And my sister and I had a fantastic relationship, but you never know when the last time is going to be the last time. And for me, that's like such a hard thing to think about. And I have so much guilt wrapped in that because I was not living near my sister at the time. She was back home in Dallas. I was chasing my professional wrestling dreams in Philadelphia with my buddy Wheeler Yuda, who's going to be a groomsman at my wedding. Shout out to you, Yuda. I love you so much. Um, but I was not there. I was not there to help her, take care of her, because we knew what she was struggling with, you know, very severe mental health conditions, bipolar disorder, bipolar disorder severe depression, things of that nature. But she was a fighter. Um, and so I have a lot of guilt in that sense of not just not being around. Um, and I know that guilt is... Um, is unwarranted because my sister told me many times how much she believed in me and my professional wrestling dreams. She filmed my very first professional wrestling match. She built my first website. She helped me with the t-shirts. Um, so she believed in me. She came to every show she possibly could. And so I knew she wanted me to be chasing my dreams. That was never a doubt in my mind because she was the best big sister ever. But those thoughts still flood. They still flood me six years later. And they will for the rest of my life. What could I have done? Could I have changed this? And I know wholeheartedly that I've really dealt with these feelings. I've dug deep and said, no, I did exactly what I could have done. And the choice my sister made was the choice she made. But that doesn't stop it. Even though I know the reality and the truth of the situation, it doesn't stop my brain and my body from feeling this shame and guilt and this feeling of being a piece of shit. And I have to accept those feelings. I don't have to wallow in them. I don't have to sit in them. It's my choice what to do with them, but I do have to feel them. I'm not trying to suppress them or move them down or throw them away. And maybe at one point I would have, but I'm not now. I feel it, understand it. But I don't have to sit in it. I can let it pass and let it move. I can get my body moving, you know, and, and sort of these some of these tools that I talked about earlier, how we can implement those in the situations that we need the most. Committed to the protocols when we're feeling our worst. And so there's also, you know, just random moments where I break down. It's mostly in the car. Um, I do a lot of crying in the car. A lot of crying in the car because the song will just fucking hit me. And I'll just start bawling my eyes out. And... Early on in the journey, I tried to fight those tears back. For some reason, I thought maybe those tears were bad. Um, but now I just let it flow, man. Especially in the car, in the shower. It's mostly induced by, by music. 
um, random songs and just have this like emotional tie to them. I mean, that's the beauty of art, right? It's the beauty of art that they, they, they pull on you and they get at your heart and what you might be feeling and they help you express in those moments. Um, I see no problem with, with letting out a beautiful cry, expressing those emotions, feeling, you know, my sister and, and uh, telling her how much I love her and miss her and talking to her and telling her what's going on in my life and that her and Ree would, my fiance would, would, would get along great and have a beautiful relationship. And um, we're going to have kids, God willing, here in the next couple years. And oh man, how beautiful it would have been for her to share in those moments with us. Like, you know, those things make me incredibly sad, but they also... At, at a certain point, bring me joy that I know wholeheartedly that she would have been such a great part of our lives and they would have been great friends and she would have had such a beautiful time at our wedding because she loved a good party. Oh man, she loved a good party. And so lo really losing someone to suicide, what it really feels like, it's never gone. It's never gone. It's never gone, ever. Um, the people who are still left alive after someone takes their own life have the hardest time. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad my sister is at peace now. For sure. She was in a lot of deep, dark pain. She was in a lot of pain. And I'm happy. Yes, that's the right word. Happy that she is at peace. I love her too much to not want peace for her. But I also love her that I would have her in my life any second, at any moment. I would trade anything to have her back. Because what's left is destruction and grief and pain for everyone that loved her, specifically me and my parents. And so that's what it's really like. It's a constant struggle. It's a never ending journey of grief. You're not finished grieving ever. When I get married, I'll be grieving, but I'll also be happy at the same time. When I have my first kid, all of these moments that I wanna share with my sister that I wasn't able to will be part of my grieving journey, which will end when I die. And then maybe I'll get to see her again. Who knows? Not sure how that works, but I feel her guiding me, showing me the way. And so I don't know if those that are listening have, have felt these things before, maybe if someone they've lost or whatever, but there's no, again, there's no getting over it. Um, it's, it's challenging. I mean, that's just, that's too light of a word. It's the hardest thing that I've ever gone through in my life. And that's why I feel like every other area of my life I can tackle head on. Like I'm, I'm, I've built up this set of armor that whatever happens in my life, I can handle it because I've already gone through the worst experience that I could potentially go through as a brother. And so whatever happens, happens. Now I accept it in stride. I have awareness. I accept it. I accept it. And then I move into action. So if it happens as a coach, as a podcaster, as a husband, when I have, when I'm a dad, God willing, like all of these things, I can handle it because I've gone through this situation, but I would never want anyone in the whole world, my worst enemy to have to go through this. That's why I fight so hard for these things. That's why I started You Are Loved, which is my mental health nonprofit. That's why I talk about these things on podcasts. That's why I bring guests on who are experts in these areas. So we can move the needle forward. So hopefully we can get rid of, and no one ever has to experience getting to the darkest places in their mind, getting to the depths of hell and, and making the ultimate choice of taking their own life. Hopefully we can eliminate that. Hopefully we can get to a point where we can eliminate that, where we can cure these types of mental illnesses. Because I wish this pain on nobody. I wish no parent ever, 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 ever has to bury their own child. That is the fucking worst thing that I could ever imagine. And I love my parents to death. They're the absolute best parents on the planet. And to see them continue to move forward, to find joy, to be great parents, still to this day, is the most incredible shit that I've ever seen in my life. And I'm so glad that I found Ree, that she's brought this light into our lives. 
and we have a wedding to plan. Now they have grandkids potentially. And there's, there's things to look forward to while always, always thinking about my sister. And so maybe I don't know if I sum that up right or express my feelings, but again, I'm just trying to speak from the heart. I'm just trying to speak from the heart. This is how I really feel. And there's a jumble of mixture of emotions that I feel all the time um, from joy to fulfillness to love. Like I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world. I have health, happiness, prosperity, love. Uh, I get to do a podcast. I get to coach baseball. I get to travel talking and speaking. I get to do all these fucking incredible things. I have two amazing parents, a mom and a dad that love me to death and that I love them. There's so much love. There's so much support. I have amazing friends. But that doesn't dismiss the fact that I miss my sister every single day. Every single day. I mean, there were moments in time that I felt guilty and, again, like a piece of shit for not thinking about her. But I know she's right there. I know she's with me. I know she's guiding me. I know she's damn proud of me because I'm damn proud of her and what she went through and how she battled. And I thank her for every lesson she taught me and continues to teach me. I'm trying to live the absolute best way I know how with her as my guide. And that's how I feel. And so thank you for listening. And I'll end you with, I'll end with this quote about grief. Grief is like the ocean. It comes on waves ebbing and flowing. Sometimes the water is calm and sometimes it is overwhelming. All we can do is learn to swim. Thank you for your time and attention. I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers. Thank you very much for tuning into that episode. And if you enjoyed it, click right here, right here for another full length episode of the podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe. But most importantly, most importantly, above all else, please, please take good care of yourselves and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers.